class 174 on the Golden Doves are on page 97. The formulation of the oral law. According to Gaonic tradition, the pivotal question concerning oral law and the formulation of the Mishnah is the relationship of the text Lashon Pe Mishnah to the Ta'am Te'amin Ta'ame, sense meaning. So what is the relationship between the actual text and the meaning of the text? This is an important question. Um, I think it's a question that also affects upon the methodology of the many of the Shalot Chubot. Many of the Shalot Chubot um, are not taking account of this relationship, and it's problematic. So this is discussed in Igeret Shadira Gaon. Let's study it now. Prior to the destruction of the temple, there was no uniform authoritative text of the oral law. We said so, right? The oral law was never meant to have a uniform authoritative text. Rather, everybody taught it in their own language. The sages knew the te'amim of the Torah, but would formulate them to the disciples in his own words. Right? So, for example, you have the pasuk in the Torah, right? And you understand the meaning of the pasuk, and the teacher would explain the meaning to his talmidim in his own words. Here's the lashon of the uh, Sheri Ragaon. Prior to the destruction of the temple, the ancients had no need for this formulation of the Mishnah, since it is the oral law, and the ta'am was not yet expressed in a definite formula as was the case with the written law. Obviously, the written law had a text, right? Um, we, we know that. But the ta'amim, or the te'amim, the meanings, there was no text. But they knew and learned the ta'ameh in their hearts, conceptually. They studied the concepts. Each and every one would teach them to his disciples as if he was narrating to his friend with any words that he chose, right? So let's say when I speak to you, I don't have to speak to you in a particular formula. Formula. We just have a common language, and I, I express my thoughts in whatever words I choose to express my thoughts in. Similarly, when the teachers would teach the meanings of the Pesukim to the Talmudim, they would teach these meanings using whatever words um, uh, they chose. The Talmud of the Torah were comprehended as if they had been halakha received from Moses at Sinai. At Sinai. Now these meanings were understood fully at the conceptual level, right? As a halakha le Moshe Sinai. Uh, so there was no doubt as to what these concepts were. There were no variations or disputes among them. Yeah. During that, and that's under the quote, during that period, the most common method of study was a judicial exegesis of scripture. So what they would do is, since they knew the ta'amim, the ta'amim and since there was no question as to what the ta'amim are, what the meanings are, and the concepts are, what they would do is, they would try to create derashot, and this is why the Midrash al is so important, the purpose of the Midrash al was to connect the Pesukim, which we got from Moshe Rabbeinu, with the Te'amim, which we also received from Moshe Rabbeinu, but these Te'amim had no specific formulation, so we wanted to kind of anchor the Te'amim in the Pesukim. That's Midrash al The object of this method was to show how a particular law was remiza, hinted, suggested in the Torah. Right. This was accomplished by applying the canons of exegesis, current in rabbinic rhetoric, to the text of scripture. So of course, you had particular and you apply the to the study, um, to, to the, uh, you would create the rashot based on these middot to connect the te'amim with the pesukim. Since the oral law was not yet formulated, it had the status of pirushe, commentaries, explanations, as those that we explain today to our disciples who all studied, but each wrote differently. So these pirushim, these pirushe, says Rabbeinu um, Sherira Gaon, right, they were transmitted to the Tambidim. And um, each one of the Tambidim would write it in his own language. This does not mean that at this time there was no Mishnah. Now, very interesting. Just because everybody would use their own language doesn't mean there was no Mishnah. 
In effect, there were ancient texts of the oral law even before the destruction of the temple, which is fascinating. Even before Halban Bait Sheni, there was um, already um, written formulations, halakhot, let's call it, of the oral law. However, these texts were not uniform in either language, scope, or methodology. That's the point. There was no uniform language used to express an idea. There was no uniform scope. What are we going to be discussing? What are we going to have halachot on? Right? Or methodology. And here we're quoting Lev Shadir Gaon. And with this we shall conclude. No individual among the ancients ever wrote that is published anything concerning the oral law until the end of the days of Judah the Prince. It's only at the end of the, Budana, the days of the Budana Sea that this uh, took place, but there was a, a set formulation. Also, there was no single text that all studied with the same words and language, right? Because as we said, the teachers would teach it however they want to teach it. They only knew the, ta'a, the ta'ame, and they conformed with each other in regard to their understanding. Right, yeah, the concept. They knew the concepts. Therefore, different texts did not imply controversy, right? Because of course you form you formulate things in your own words, and another person formulates it in his words, and the different formulations don't apply a different conceptual understanding. Moreover, they knew which case was universally agreed upon and which was a majority opinion, and also there were cases where there was halachot where they knew everybody agrees with these halachot, and then there was halachot where there was a mahlokat and they knew what the majority opinion was. However, they did not possess an edited composition in a formulated text which all recited with the same words and language. Because all the sages were in agreement with each other concerning the ta'amim and traditions, each would formulate them to his respective disciples in, his, in the language and methodology of his choice. Some chose a concise method. Others chose to teach general principles while others chose specific cases. Every, every teacher has his own methodology, but there was no real mahalokat between the teachers. There was just different linguistic formulations expressing the same concepts. There were those who were prolix and included in the treatment of a subject, analogies and further analogies of the first analogies. Every rabbi would recite, that is, study the formula that his master had taught him. One would put one subject first, and another would put it last, one would be concise and the other wordy. So this is the way things were prior to the formal um, formulation of the oral law by the Ben Wakadosh. In the next class, we will continue this discussion.